Yep. We're live. We're live. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to today's special live workshop on your setting quotas wrong, the science of how smarter quotas massively increase productivity. Before we jump into today's content, I'm really, really excited to have Sanj, uh, founder and CEO at Concert, joining us. Longtime sponsor of MSP. One of the great parts about Sanj is he's actually a recovering chief financial officer. So he's had this both from uh, the perspective of a CFO and from the perspective of somebody who's really building a company to solve some of these problems. But Sanj, before we jump into your introduction and background on concert, we have a tradition here on MSP, and it's been a few months since you've been with us. What new hobbies or skills have you picked up or honed since the start of the pandemic? We'd love to learn just a little bit more about our speakers before we jump in. Um, we had a major leak in our bathroom. Um, so we had to pick out new stone for our bathroom. Learned a lot about stone and veining in it. What's good veining, what's bad veining. Any, any lessons that we're gonna bring forward today from what a good vein is in a stone into how to make a good comp plan? Do you think we can make those, can we, can we make that connection today or is that too much? Uh, yeah, you set the same kinds of targets, both for your stone and uh, your quotas. I love it. I love it. I love yeah. it. Excellent. No, the well, pandemic folks. is horrible. I'm learning a lot of things <laughs> that I wish I never did. <laughs> folks, uh, today, today, obviously, Sanj is one of the best in the business. This um, Today is a little bit different than our traditional digital events. We're going to be moving through a fair amount of um, programming here. Please do use the question and answer panel to ask questions. I can't guarantee we're going to get to them all, especially if the audience gets really, really fired up. But we're going to do our best to make it through those. Using that also allows us to follow up afterwards. So maybe Sanj wants to drop you a note with some additional content on what we're talking about. But Sanj, are you ready? You want to jump into it? Uh, sure. Let's do it. So before I hand it off to Sanj to take us through our amazing program today, just a few words about modern sales pros. For those of you who don't know, Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest community for revenue leaders in sales management, sales or revenue operations, sales enablement, and the related supporting disciplines. Our mission is to create an environment where our community members can answer questions they'd otherwise struggle to solve on their own. We do that through a pretty robust online discussion and by bringing amazing speakers and amazing content programs like Sanj and like what we're going to talk through today to the community. We're growing very, very quickly. And for those of you who aren't members, you'll be invited to join afterwards. One of the great parts about this community is it's free for our members. And when you ask questions of it, you get perspective, not just from leaders like Sanj, but also from folks that are at all the organizations and about 5,000 others that you see here. So great, great perspective. But enough about MSP. I'm going to hand it over for Sanj, uh, founder and CEO at Concert, to share a little bit about himself and then get us started today with our amazing, amazing programming. Sanj? Sure. Thanks, Rich. Um, so I'm Sanj Sanampudi, co-founder and CEO here at Concert. Uh, Concert is a platform that allows you to design your comp plans and also track your commissions uh, seamlessly. Uh, a lot of what makes us different is, is that, as Rich mentioned, I'm a former CFO myself. Uh, my team was always uh, designing and managing comp plans. And uh, the interesting that thing that happened when we started Concert is we started seeing patterns about uh, how, how comp plans were performing. So some companies had plans with certain features that seemed to be doing really well. And others had plans with other features that didn't seem to do well. So we worked with neuroscientists and behavioral psychologists to understand what goes on in our brains when we see comp. Um, and that really is sort of the, the foundation for our agenda today, um, is sharing some of the, the work we've done uh, with scientists to figure out, like, is there really a science to commission? Spoiler, there is. Um, 
And so our agenda for today, we're going to try to make it quick and uh, take as many questions as we can. Um, but our agenda for today is first uh, talk about why we are boldly saying that you're setting quotas wrong. I don't really know many of you. I don't know your plans, but I can tell you you're probably doing it wrong or approaching it wrong. Um, when I look back on my own career, I think of all of the really, really nice, passionate salespeople that I accidentally screwed over, um, <laughs> or the, the times that I was like accidentally lucky and set the right comp plan. Um, the, then we'll go into the science of commission. So like what is actually happening in your brain, in your body, um, when, when you're getting a commission plan? Um, how do we perceive quotas overall and get you to the place where you can actually set smarter targets for your team on your own? So uh, you're setting quotas wrong. And mainly we know it's broken because we see uh, stats like this. So you can see a longitudinal study from CSO Insights in the Alexander Group that shows uh, quota attainment from 2011 to 2016. Uh, it was dropping from 60% to about 50%. Um, they actually stopped keeping the time series of that data because it just didn't get better. It was mostly depressing for everyone who saw it. Um, and, you know, I think for, for many of you, you can kind of test this against your own experience. Did it seem like most of the team was hitting quota or most of the team wasn't, or it was evenly split? And I think a lot of people anecdotally can, can see this in their own experience. Um, but we know that there's a different way to think about targets. And uh, I'll put Rich on the spot and hope he doesn't remember the answer to this from our prep session. But do you remember what the most common marathon finish time is? Uh, I, I don't remember, but I remember still thinking, I was like, that would be really fast for me. So probably faster than, you know, six hours. That would be my, yeah. probably my guess. It's about how long I could do a marathon in, so. Um, good guess, it is faster than six hours. It's three hours and 59 minutes. And more than the time itself, I would encourage uh, everyone to look at this graph where you see these milestone times in blue and how performance increases up to the milestone time and drops off right afterwards. So. Uh, the difference between 359 and 401, there's a 40% drop off in performance. And what we're learning from this marathon example is that we're wired to want to hit targets. Targets matter a lot. And when you have something like quota where 50% of the team is not engaging with the target, you know that we're setting it wrong. So uh, taking a step back, like we, we wanted to know like what actually is going on in our brains when we're, we're getting commissions. Like how is a commission plan like helping us get better, be motivated? How does it all work? And um, kind of the resounding research that we got back was uh, their feedback loop. Um, so feedback loops answer three questions. Where am I going? How do I get there? And based on where I am, where do I go next? It's kind of like a you know, GPS in your brain. Um, and what, what we've seen from our own experience and from some of the customers we were working with is really when we think about commissions, this is where kind of all the nonsense about like coin operated sales reps uh, comes from. It's because we're trying to lead from the very end of the feedback loop. Um, but the commission is really the outcome uh, of everything else. So our brains from that marathon example are target driven. So quotas are actually the mechanism that you're going to use to focus and motivate your team. Quotas are the place that you lead from, and commission is really the output from it. In a number of studies, they show that ability to achieve the target matters more than the, the reward on the other side. Um, 
there are also a, a few things that happen in our body. So like we know targets matter because our bodies change. Um, our blood pressure goes up uh, in a safe way, like not, you know, it's about to kill us. But like if a, a target is moderately challenging, our blood pressure increases. Our blood pressure increases to prepare us to physically move. Um, and that happens even if they're intellectual targets. It's and interesting. Uh, the, the, the impossible actually is the lowest of the bunch. It's, it's like it's yeah, not even a so goal at that point. That's, that's, that's fascinating. It's the myth of the like stretch target. The stretch target is a number that someone once wrote that means <laughs> almost nothing to anyone. And no one's worried about it because they are, oh, it's, it's, it's completely unrealistic. I'm not even going to, there's no chance in heck. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you should actually set stretch targets if you want your team to be really calm and relaxed and feel very complacent. <laughs> so you're saying we are setting quotas wrong then, Saj. <laughs> Correct. Uh, the, the other thing is um, what actually happens in your brain when you get these targets. So if you get targets that you feel like you can win, that you're coming close to winning, um, these white parts in these scans are uh, uh, electrical pathways that are fired up in your brain. So this is neural activity. And the parts that are lit up are the parts of your brain that, that help you learn. So whether you're winning or you're even coming close to the target, you're actively learning. So everything we know about reward-based learning, about commissions, about how these programs should work, is that if we set the right targets, we are going to be more receptive to learning the behaviors to get there. We're going to be more able to think about um, creative solutions to get there. And we're going to be more prepared to act on opportunities. And we've seen this in our own work. Um, so smarter targets help teams perform better. Uh, we worked with a company that had uh, about 30 reps. Their uh, quota was about 50,000 a month. And on average, the team was attaining 30,000 a month. Uh, our algorithm said that they should drop quota by 15%, which they did. And then over the next three months, their average attainment went up by 15%. And, you know, for people who are like, you know, four and a half thousand a month, that's like not a lot. Well, you know, over a year, that's, that's about 55,000 and over 30 reps, that's about 1.5 million of ARR that this company is bringing in by changing their targets. Um, so, the goal of this session is like, hopefully I've made this compelling case where you're like, uh, maybe we're setting credits wrong. Um, <laughs> the goal of this session is then to walk you through like, how can you approach quotas differently? Like what are the, the frameworks and the tools to think about um, quota in a way that, that's a little bit more rooted in the science and a little bit less rooted in kind of the stories that we all hold personally uh, in comp. And, and I think that was one of the things when we were doing the prep session and Sean shared uh, both this program and tomorrow's, it's, it does challenge conventional wisdom. And it is, it is a little bit uncomfortable to think for all of us who've set quotas for however many quarters and annual planning cycles we've been through, that there are some fundamental things that we've been maybe lucky to get right, but we've been either... Uh, incongruent or wrong more often than not. And I think that this, this part of the program is super, super, super uh, illuminating for me. And I'm, I'm hoping that as San shares is that folks, as you have questions about this, if you don't agree, like go ahead and feel free to feel free to challenge on this because it is definitely thought provoking. So Sanjay, I just wanted to give that caveat before you, before you hop in here. Yeah, sure. Uh, so how, how do we perceive quotas? How do we perceive targets? Um, we look through, through four lenses. Um, this is a theory in psychology called constructal level theory. Um, 
and the the four lenses that we look through are are spatial so is something big or small how far away is it uh temporal is it close to today close to this moment or farther away experiential uh are these like skills or achievements that i've had or are they kind of theoretical um and social is this something that is relevant for people I associate with, or is it for another group? Combined, uh, this distance is called psychological distance. So we're going to talk about the psychological distance uh, of your targets. Um, this is probably like the squishy part that CFO me would have vomed all over, but like I promise it will get more tactical. Um, so why does constro level theory matter why does psychological distance matter um so the shorter the psychological distance the more capable our brain is to translate these abstract targets and goals into really specific actions to get there and the the example that we're going to uh use through through um these four lenses is uh, saving for retirement. So, spatial distance. Um, this again is just like the size of the target. Um, is it large or small? Is it a complex uh, target to get to versus a simple target? So in retirement planning world, uh, the current estimate is that someone point seven million dollars to retire. Um, while you are all panicking about that, uh, you can also think about uh, set aside five hundred dollars now. So just the magnitude of one point seven million versus five hundred. I mean, five hundred dollars now is also a lot, but it's less than one point seven million. Um, in the sales world, uh, that translates to in two ways. So on the sales side, when we're setting quotas that are a million dollars a year, are you setting a million dollar number because it's like big and round and nice? That might be something that feels good on the spreadsheet, but it's probably something that optically makes the number look bigger. You know, it's the same thing as like, pricing with 99 at the end. Even if you made it 999,999, that is better than a million. Um, that is spatial distance. Six figures is less than seven. Um, the complex versus simple, I would point to more what we see in um, CS plans. So if you uh, are giving your account managers a 95% gross retention target, that is a lot of math that you're kind of dropping on to the account manager. So they're trying to think, oh, the aggregate portfolio that can renew now has this book of business, so I need to close this much, and how am I going to make that? How do you translate that into an action? Like, as an account manager, you're probably just trying to do the best for each deal that you can. So, one thing we advocate for through this lens is, uh, especially on the CS sides, like move away from these efficiency metrics and try to move and push yourself to these nominal figures. So something like you need to renew or book 950,000 in Q1. Notice I said less than a million, uh, even there. I think I'm, I'm laughing right now uh, on mute here because I think there's a, especially for the more operationally minded, we're gonna pay for everything and we're gonna have all of these different levers and then you need an applied math degree to figure out how much you're gonna get paid, which is a, as an account executive or as a customer success manager, Sanj, to your point, is uh, not, not, a, not, not the right use of the time for those folks or for the ops person to walk through the comp spreadsheet with 16 sellers every quarter. Right, and again, it's translating a target to a specific behavior. Where am I going? What do I do to get there? And what do you do to get to 95% gross retention? I don't fucking know. Like that's like really 
the, the answer that most people would give you. What do you, I need to do to like paper $950,000? That's a little bit more intuitive to break down into actions. So the, the next lens is um, temporal distance. So this is the future versus the present. So back in this retirement example, it's $1.7 million to retire in 40 years uh, for like Hannah, um, for the rest of us, much less. Um, but, uh, versus setting aside $500 this month. Um, time matters a lot in how our brain processes activities. The, the, probably the most famous study on temporal distance was one that was done on uh, how people perceive vacations. So if I asked you what a vacation looked like that you wanted to take a year from now, you'd be like, well, I want to go somewhere warm. Um, I probably want to go to a beach. Uh, you, you would kind of talk in these like abstract goals. When that same question was posed to you uh, three weeks away from your vacation, the answer started shifting to, you know, I want to go to this restaurant. I want to read this book. I want to listen to this podcast. So the, the way people described their experience became much more tactical. And the same thing happens in sales. And, you know, the, the way to think about this is if you have annual quotas, think about quarterly. If you have quarterly quotas, think about monthly. Uh, and Probably the most nuanced part of this is if you only pay on closed one, start thinking about paying on pipeline activities. So again, you're trying to bring people a little bit closer in time to what they can really control and they can visualize success for. So the next lens is experiential distance. Um, this is how easy do we make the theory of the right thing uh, versus the practice of the right thing. So in, in our retirement example, the theory is like, yeah, I can deposit money into my retirement account. Like, I would want to do that. I know I want to retire one day. The practice of it is much simpler when it's automatically deducted from your account. Um, for experiential distance in sales, what we really see works well is, you know, usually more similar to the bottom-up forecasting that teams are already doing now. I, I think when we work with customers now, we see that their top-down budget usually takes priority, and the bottom-up forecast is like, you know, a nice thing that you do to see like how much of a stretch budget is going to be. Um, but really the, the value of that bottom-up forecast shows up in experiential distance because this is, these are the numbers your team has actually hit before. Uh, and when you take that one level down, these are the numbers that your team knows these scripted behaviors to hit again. Sanj, I have a, I have a question on this. Um, so when we talk about quotas based on prior performance, I think that makes sense conceptually. What does this mean practically? Does this mean on a person by person basis? So Sally did 800K last year, her quota is going to be 850? Or does it mean, uh, yeah, what, what can you just expand on that a little bit? Double click in, please. Yeah, we'll actually go through this in an example in a second. But what you're looking for are your, your team's performance in aggregate, and where you see aggregate sort of plateaus or breaks in performance. So like, oh, a bunch of people get to this level and then like no one gets to one more deal past that. That's how we kind of get people to think about this. Um, the other way to think about experiential distance and it's sort of tied into that same example is think about accelerator tiers or achievement tiers to create a progression to get up to quota. So if Sally said 850K and I have only closed like 400 on my best quarter, maybe set a tier at 425 and another one at 670 and then another one at you know, 850. So kind of build my way up there. Um, 
the last one is social distance. This is like the OG social distance. Um, and it's really uh, the, the notion of other groups versus my group. Um, in, in the retirement example, what you see with retirement plans is there is actually a really low participation rate in companies that are opaque about how many people are contributing through the company plan. It's unclear if other people are saving. Uh, when you're able to post something like 90% of the company is saving through a retirement plan, it is really easy to move the needle from 90 to 97% because people are like, oh, I'm like everyone else here. I should be saving too. Um, Social pressure is like real even after high school. Um, in sales, this translates to that original graph I showed you. If 50% of the team is hitting target, 50% of the team is not hitting target. It's a coin flip. It doesn't mean I'm good or bad. It's just like, ah, that's what I got this month. That's what I got this year. If 80% of the team is hitting quota, stakes are raised. You don't want to be part, you know, I'm part of the 80%. I'm part of the team that's performing. Um, that really, really dramatically changes the notion of like how we set quotas, how we think about quotas, and how much of the team should be hitting quota. So uh, do we want to pause there for questions or? I think Good. we can let's uh, let's keep raw because we're almost done here, right? We've got okay. four or five more slides. Yeah, why don't folks just start getting those questions queued up, and Sanj will hit those once we're done, kind of walking through the real life example. But go ahead and use the Q and A panel. We've also got some great questions that came in during registration, but I think walking through the practical example will be helpful for folks to sink their teeth into this a little bit more. Great. Um, so, how do you set these smarter quotas? This is a real example uh, of 10 reps who had a quarterly quota of 90K. Uh, we had an average sales price of 10K. The sales cycle was 30 days. You can see the performance here. The team wasn't doing well. And another way that you would know that the team was not doing well is the sales team was transferred to me, the CFO. You know, things are really bad if the CFO is running sales. Um, so not knowing anything about sales, I, I was sort of at a loss, but I know a shit ton about math. So I, I tried to kind of math my way out of the problem and, and it accidentally worked. Um, so this is what we, how we would look at it today. You know, this is a real answer that I didn't know um, before. But you know the spatial distance is the 90K versus on average attaining about 20K. The temporal distance was they had quarterly targets versus the monthly sales cycle. So if I'm thinking three months out, well, I actually don't even have visibility to three months out. I, how do I translate that to a behavior? Um, for the experiential side, it was um, there were no progression or targets. And on the social side, no one got to quota. Like everyone missed it. It was bad quota. Um, so we now use what we call a plan performance graph. You can make one of these at home. Uh, a lot of you are ops folks. I know you can do this. Um, on the x axis, uh, you're going to have dollars or units and try to space them one average sales price apart. On the y-axis, you're going to have the percent of the team achieving that level of quota. Uh, you're going to look for big drops, and then you're going to try to build a pathway to your target. So what you can see here is, you know, I had a, you know, close to 100% of my team able to close 10K a quarter. Great job, everyone. Uh, you know, it was more like 80, 90% were getting to 20K, and then whoosh, I lost about 40% of my team's performance once we got to 30. Um, and then again, you see a big drop off at 50. And I, want, I knew the thing that made the financial model work was that 90K. So I wanted to build this pathway up to 90K. Um, 
what is really cool about this experience is it makes me look super smart um, because three months later, this is what my team's performance looked like. And what's even cooler is once people reach that first milestone, they don't want to fall backward. So they're looking for that next step, that next accelerator tier, you know, looking for two deals away. Um, right now, this team is actually hitting about 90K a month. Um, so final lessons, the cheat sheet. Um, you know, if there's one lesson to impart, it's that quota is not for the company. It is for your reps. The only people who get any benefit from this number is your team. It focuses them, it motivates them, it helps them translate, you know, in, translate these abstract ideas into concrete behaviors that they can do every day. Um, your top-down planning looks good on a spreadsheet. It won't help you hit your number. That's the spatial distance idea of like lower, uh, lower your targets and build intermediate targets up to quota. Um, your quota period should map, match uh, reps visibility. So try to match your sales cycle where you can. Um, and if you have longer, longer sales cycles, definitely try to add in components where you're paying on pipeline stages. That's one way to, to break down this really long, year-long sales cycle. What do I do next? You should be sharing this content piece with them. And if you do that, you get a spec. Uh, the bottom-up forecasts that you guys are doing are, can give you a sense of those natural breaks. Use the prior performance graph that we just reviewed. Um, and commit to 80% or higher quota attainment. The social pressure of quota is really holding you back if you're not at that level right now. That's it. Take a, it. take a, take our breaths on. That, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was, it was pretty, pretty good on the timing front. Take a, take a sip there. This was, this was really awesome, Sanj. We got a bunch of questions from registration. Um, folks, uh, please do use the Q&A panel uh, as well. And we're going we're gonna to have Sanj for probably the next 15 or so. This dude's been building comp plans uh, like nobody's business. I actually have a question for you on this, Sanj, um, more from personal experience. I, I was selling sort of early stage company, but very large enterprise deals. Think quarter of a million dollars and up, very long sales cycles. How does this apply in, in kind of the extreme end like, like that with like a larger deal process or longer yeah. deal process? Um, so that's really where we advocate for, for setting targets on your pipeline stages. Like how are you moving deals forward? Like the best thing your comp plan can do is help you know exactly what you need to do to hit your goals. Um, so if you're setting goals around, hey, you need to do this many demos in January, so you have a prayer to hit your number in September, then that's the right place to, to put that. And then what would you, what would you recommend? Because I'm sure that there's a, a question on that will come in here. How, how do you recommend making that decision when maybe you don't have a full picture of this is what it takes to get from first conversation to close one business? Uh, built around the, the stages you know. So if all you know right now is that someone needs to pick up the phone and call someone, then pay on that. Um, so you can start as basic as prospecting um, and kind of get as advanced as uh, we worked with a customer um, who, who probably should have been very negatively impacted by COVID. Um, and what we could tell from their pipeline data is that they're it seemed like they were losing more at their demo stage than they necessarily should have been. But some people were doing really, really well converting from demo. Um, we introduced an incentive there to see, hey, if we pay everyone on demos, and specifically if they're answering three questions uh, after each demo in Salesforce, will that, will that improve performance? And what they ended up seeing is uh, their team got to like 90% attainment um, in Q2 
when they're an events business. Uh, so that's like a pretty significant uh, save. Well, and, and it feels like too, that could be a, a coaching opportunity as well, just inspecting that inflection point and going, is this a, is, do we have the, the AE trained up to be able to convert demos to late stage or is it a, they're just everything under the sun? Yeah, and I think another point to bring up there is like, no one's supposed to win 100% of the time. That's like not the job that you're signing up for in sales. Um, if you want to be right 100% of the time, go into accounting because there's always an answer. <laughs> um, but in sales, like you actually are going to lose quite a bit and that negative feedback really does take a toll on adherence to process and behavior. You try to take shortcuts because you did this thing before and it didn't work. You know it if you don't know if it didn't work because it wasn't the right fit for the customer or if it was the process itself. It's, it's funny how much of this comes down to being disciplined and how you and how you approach your go-to-market motion, having the data, but also setting the right quotas and also being deliberate about stage to stage. Um, some questions, some questions coming in here. Uh, longtime MSP member and MSP most valuable pro, Matt Cameron. Sanj, I know you know him. Actually, great question coming in from Matt here. What is your perspective, Sanj, on cost recovery plans? So this is where a rep must cover their own cost before they start to get commission. Yeah, I, I think that is, uh, that is totally fine as long as reps have a clear path to recovering cost. So, you know, this session we're all about like, why targets matter, like, and, and a cost recovery plan, if the target of recovering your cost is attainable, totally makes sense. Tomorrow, if anyone wants to join, plug for tomorrow's session, it's all about the math of like, okay, I sort of believe what you're saying, like, how am I going to afford this? So, because it sounds like you're just paying people more money. Um, and this is like the, the reward doesn't actually need to be like egregious for any of these. I think that's I think that's great perspective. And Sanj, there's a, there's another question. This came in from um, registration, and I know we'll dive into this more deeply tomorrow. But how do you handle situations where there's a dual ownership of quota? You see this sometimes in a strategic accounts model where there's maybe a account manager and an account executive both working Disney, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're you're mapping again to that that feedback loop, which we have right here. Good thing I put it there. Um, did they do the right behaviors? Did they, was this part of their target? Did they do the right behavior? Then pay them. And if you, if you need to comp a bunch of folks on a specific deal, um, there, there are two cases to that. Like one, you can calibrate the rates so that you know, you know, there will be some over, like overlay commission, um, or two, you can learn um, and like kind of a, a sidebar from my time at Return Pass, like we closed one massive global deal that like 17 people were comped on. Well, like this customer wasn't the only global customer we had. So what we realized is actually we needed a different team and a different sales motion for those types of customers. Um, so I think you, you really kind of balance the two of those. Sounds uh, more, a slightly more tactical question, uh, more just around like the quarter review motion. I know we talked about this a lot at the beginning of the pandemic, but how, how frequently would you recommend organizations review this for those inflection points? Is it quarterly, monthly, annually? Uh, yeah, I, I would say it really depends on your business. Um, Semi-annual seems to be the best cadence. I would say something like, you know, the start of the pandemic was like a good reason to intervene. Um, but assuming there isn't like another, you know, pangolin led outbreak, um, there, <laughs> there is like not a reason to do that. But giving people enough time to actually digest their targets and like figure out what they're going to do to eventually get there is important. So I think six months is probably enough time in most sales motions to figure that out. Um, 
and then like recalibrating based on that uh, when performance stabilizes a little bit. I think a big thing that people often miss when they're reviewing attainment numbers is that that just like marathon performance, your comp plan caused your attainment to look a certain way. So untangling like how much was driven from your comp plan versus like what performance really could have been is really difficult. That's a, I think that's a, a great point. And there's a few more registration questions and a few more live questions I wanna, I wanna get to here, Son. So thanks for, thanks for kind of taking these in stride. Uh, this is actually a pretty interesting one and I don't think we've talked about this too much in, in all of our conversations on comp. Any thoughts on strategies for maybe future projected revenue? So you see this sometimes in ad sales, right? Where I close a, a purchase order, but it's not really worth anything until you actually start buying ads. Any, any thoughts on how to compensate in that world? Is it different? Is it the same? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, earlier in my career, I worked at Viacom. I like vividly remember like a $2 million deal from an auto manufacturer, like coming across my desk. Uh, in 2008 and yeah, that was never gonna get paid, it didn't. Um, and that is, that is like a really good question. Um, in reality, what, what your team has done is got to a pipeline stage. So I would think about like, hey, you know what? You got that piece of paper signed, that's huge. That should be celebrated, that should be like, you know, a tick mark in, in your achievement and you should get quota credit for it. Um, do you, does that need to tie to the payout because the next thing also needs to happen? Um, so our view is like for, for like residual businesses, like getting the piece of paper signed is part of the sales process, but not the end of it. It's a milestone to be achieved on the way to, to greater revenue yep. recognition. All right, and this is the last question that we're gonna take here from Brandon. It's coming in live. It's a great tee up. And Sanj, I think you can give a preview for our conversation tomorrow in answering this. And Brandon, I'm gonna paraphrase your question here, my man. Uh, Brandon's question is around the ops to finance conversation. Finance really relies heavily on the quota capacity model, but mm -hmm. sales recognizes the quotas like, you might as well make it, make me run a three minute mile, ain't gonna happen. How do you even start having that? Just give folks a preview of what we've got in store for tomorrow. Uh, math, yeah, it's just math. Uh, and, and in reality, like I, I think the, the thing I would always kind of suggest to people now it, and you know, with my old hat in, in my pocket, it, it's uh, ultimately this is about you improving the productivity of your team. So as long as you can make the, the CAC work and as long as you can make the budget model work, what that payout looks like doesn't matter. So uh, tomorrow, if people want to join, we're going to talk about what is that analysis that gets finance to, um, to, to buy in and to really partner with you on this. And, and the answer is like no one has the right answer. So you, you need, instead of thinking about specific numbers, you need to think about ranges um, and we'll show you how tomorrow. There's going to be a whole lot on that tomorrow. We're going to talk about Monte Carlo simulations, which aren't just uh, going to a cool casino on the water. I, I learned, um, but Sanj. It's going to we, a cool spreadsheet at your desk. Spreadsheet heaven at the desk, mm -hmm. at the home casino. I love it. Um, Sanj, it's always a pleasure to have you and the team from Concert involved. I always feel like I get this amazing interdisciplinary lesson on how to really think and how to help our sales leaders in the MSP community think differently, more holistically, and better about how to motivate and incentivize their team. Um, Sanj, really excited to do a session just like this tomorrow with you. But on behalf of all of our attendees, the folks watching the recording, the 20,000 folks in the MSP community, um, thank you so, so much for taking some time today to share and look forward to doing uh, diving into the CFO conversation tomorrow. Thank you and uh, happy 2021 planning, everyone. Excellent. Sanj, take care, everyone stay safe and we'll uh, see you all tomorrow.